Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to 130B, quantum mechanics. So uh, let's uh, get going. Uh, so today we are going to continue learning about uh, property of operators, especially operator algebra. So let me first review what we have learned. Uh, first of all, we have learned that in quantum mechanics, state of a system is described by a vector. And then if you want to change the state, you need to act on the vector by an operator. And then uh, the state vector, the, the operator is like a matrix, which you can multiply to the state vector and then change the state vector. So that's the basic idea. And then uh, operator itself as a matrix, they can also multiply with each other. So that's why we need to study operator algebra. We need to know how operators multiply with each other. So the meaning of multiplying two operators together is basically to compose its action together. So if you have OMP op operator uh, multiply or the, its product, basically it corresponds to a new operator whose action on any vector or any state is like first acting P and then X Q, Q or, and then X O. Okay, so, uh, so this uh, multiplication of operator is represented as multiplication of matrices. And because matrices don't commute with each other, their multiplication, so in general, uh, we, have a, we can calculate the commutator between operator, which is the difference between two different ways of multiplying two operators. And last time, we also mentioned there is this uh, uh, Pauli operators, which, is, uh, which are operators two by two matrices uh, that acts on a qubit. And then we summarize their action, or their uh, multiplication in this multiplication table, or in this formula, or in terms of this uh, uh, vectorized uh, operator representation. So this m dot sigma, let me remind you again, because we will see that again today. So m dot sigma means that m is a is a three component real vector, uh, doesn't need to be real, three component vector. Uh, these are its uh, vector components, these are numbers, but this sigma hat with a board symbol basically is a, a vectorized operator, meaning that each vector component itself is already an operator, so it's basically a three by two by two tensor. It's no longer just a matrix, it's actually more complicated than a matrix. It becomes a three dimensional tensor where this two by two part is a two by two matrix representing each one of these operators, and there are three of them, so it's uh, like that. Uh, and the meaning of this vector dot with that three by two by two tensor, the resulting uh, uh, the resulting object is a two by two matrix, which is this, uh, which is this operator m dot sigma. Okay, so this formula basically tells us how do we take m dot sigma and n dot sigma and then uh, finish this matrix multiplication at the algebraic level. Okay, uh, towards the end of last lecture, we uh, touch upon this concept of commutator. Commutator describes the difference between uh, two operator uh, multiplying in different ways. And then uh, when the commutator is zero, we say that the two operators commute with each other. And then uh, the operator's commutator has several uh, algebraic properties, such as bilinearity or uh, product rules, which I, I guess you can uh, basically derive them uh, based on its definition. So uh, for Pauli operators, we can again calculate its commutator. The non-trivial commutator for Pauli operator so, uh, 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 amount sigma x and sigma y and sigma z, basically, because when, when you have x multiply sigma x multiply sigma y, the result is i sigma z. But if you exchange the order, become sigma y multiply sigma x, the result is minus i sigma z. So the difference between these two uh, multiplication is basically twice of i sigma z. And that's the same, uh, that's the same reason for the other formulas, such that we can summarize everything in this uh, formula using the Levi Civita symbol, which is defined up there in equation 106, uh, 107. Okay? So this Levi Civita symbol is a three-dimensional uh, three anti-symmetric tensor where it, uh, it basically look at ABC. If ABC is following the XYZ order, then it gives you plus one. If it's following the uh, ZYX order, it gives you minus one. Otherwise, if there's uh, repeating indices in uh, ABC, then this uh, epsilon goes to zero. 
Okay, so this formula can also be, <laughs> uh, there's also a vectorized way of writing down this component uh, wise the firm formula uh, that is this, this guy. So people sometimes also write sigma cross sigma. So the meaning of this is because, uh, uh, for example, if you have sigma cross sigma, it's Z component. It's Z component essentially is sigma x sigma y minus sigma y sigma x, for example. So, uh, so, so, so which, which equals, this is uh, 2i sigma z, right? So, so I'm just taking a special component as an example. When you have two vectors multiply, uh, cross product with each other, uh, by definition, the z component goes like xy component multiply and then minus yx, right? So that's the definition uh, of cross product. I guess uh, that's just a, just a different way of writing the same thing. Any questions? Okay, so if not, then uh, that's it for, <laughs> for the review of uh, operator commutator and then how to uh, compute the commutator on, for example, Pauli operators. So now we are going to introduce a new concept, which is called operator function. So, so you may feel like, uh, yeah, <laughs> Professor Yu is never talking about quantum mechanics. It's all about math. Uh, well, yes. So, <laughs> uh, so the lecture till now is uh, uh, we have some very general discussion of operators. But it turns out to be very important, because once we have this uh, knowledge, we can apply them to understand measurement and uh, time evolution. For example, this operator function will be very important in understanding time evolution unitary operators later, so let's uh, talk about it for now. Uh, we can define functions for operators. So for example, for a number, we can define function uh, like this. Uh, a function of some real number, uh, you can tailor expand it as a, as a linear superposition of all the powers of this uh, number, right? So uh, this is how we define functions uh, for real numbers. So now we are encountering operators. An operator also, you can define operator power. Uh, the nth power of an operator simply is composition of this operator n times. So it's like, uh, it's a new operator which corresponding to acting the operator on the state n times, basically. Uh, so that's why you need to take the matrix representation of this operator and then multiply it n times. N n copies of the matrix multiplied together, that will be the matrix representation of this uh, powered operator. And then uh, if, if there's a function that is uh, defined uh, on, in the real domain in terms of certain Taylor expansion, and all the information about the function is encoded in the Taylor expansion coefficient, you can use the same coefficient to linearly combine all the power of this operator and define the function of that operator. So that's the idea. Uh, for example, if you want to define an uh, exponential function or define a sine function or cosine function, they all have very different power, uh, not, maybe not very different, but somewhat related, but still different, <laughs> Taylor expansion coefficient, right? So you basically, this Taylor expansion coefficient is like a, uh, like a, like a, like a encoding of the function. So, uh, so you can use the same Taylor expansion coefficient to define the same function for operators at the operator level. But the, what the only difference is that here, this x to the nth power is just a real number. But here, this o hat to the nth power is a complex matrix. So you are linearly combining these matrices together. Uh, for example, you can define operator exponential, which is the exponential map. Uh, exponential function in terms of real num uh, in, in real functions, uh, basically it's one, you can tailor expand it as one plus x plus x squared divided by two, x squared divided by six, and so on. Then, uh, then it basically goes like x to the nth power divided by n factorial and summing over n from zero to infinity. That's the definition of exponential function uh, in the real domain. But uh, we can just replace every uh, number x by uh, operator O, such that it goes like uh, this matrix O to the nth power, 
uh, well, when, we, when you take nth power of the matrix, you really need to multiply the matrix n times. It's not trivial. It's not taking the matrix element. It's don't take the each matrix element and power it. You need to really take the matrix multiplication n times. So usually that's very difficult to do. So uh, just abstractly, it can be defined this way. And then you ac actually need to know what's the power of this operator to all order uh, of n all the way to infinity, such that you can <laughs> combine them <laughs> with this one over n factorial uh, Taylor expansion coefficient to construct this uh, exponent. Uh, so this is, uh, so exponentiating a matrix is actually, so sometimes we also write the result as exponential, exponentiation of a matrix or an operator. Exponentiating a matrix is not exponentiating each matrix element. Uh, it's really a very difficult calculation, but sometimes it can be simple. For example, uh, here is a, a nice exercise. You can take a look. Uh, well, uh, uh, we can consider two by two matrix where everything is easier to calculate. Uh, and then you can show that uh, exponential of e to the i, i theta multiply on sigma y. So sigma y is this um, operator which is represented the two by two matrix. And then if you multiply this matrix by i theta, it's still a two by two matrix. So exponentiation of this matrix, you really need to use the <laughs> definition up there and then <laughs> compute. And then you can show that the result is uh, still a two by two matrix. But the two by two matrix is very different from this one. Uh, and how to do that? There are two different ways which I want to say. So because matrix exponential is so complicated that uh, I encourage you to use Mathematica. So in Mathematica, everything can be very simple. So you take uh, uh, sigma y, and then if you multiply that by i theta, it becomes a new two by two matrix, which looks like this, right? And then you just type this matrix in Mathematica, and then use matrix exp. Don't use exp. Use exp that will be element-wise uh, <laughs> exponential. That's wrong. So use matrix exp, and then Mathematica will give you the answer just by one click just by one click like that. OK, so, uh, but, but maybe you're not satisfied with that. But uh, uh, if you ever want to do matrix exponential, try to use Mathematica. That's always convenient. But if you always also want to know how to do it in the Taylor expansion way, here is the, here is the approach. So you can follow that. Uh, it turns out that the power of sigma y is very easy to compute. Uh, because there's a, there's, a, there's a rule that the sigma y uh, square into identity, and identity multiply anything is still anything. So, so there is some systematic rule emerging in powering this sigma y that enables us to split this uh, very tedious uh, Taylor expansion theory into uh, certain uh, two terms. And then it, within each term, the expansion can be, uh, uh, becomes, it's no longer expansion of uh, powers of operators it becomes expansion of powers of uh, numbers. But that's uh, Taylor expansion, which we know how to do. And then uh, you can simplify things and then obtain the result. So this is, uh, this is the part that uh, maybe you should take a look, uh, because we have a homework too, which is exactly the generalization of this kind of Taylor expansion version of derivation. So uh, for, um, well, for homework two, uh, try to use the definition of the Taylor expansion, uh, which is uh, two, uh, uh, one, one to one. One to one is that one. And then to prove that exponentiation of i theta sigma dot uh, 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 n dot sigma. So n dot sigma is like a, a univector. So here it is said that n is a three component real univector. For example, if this n vector is like 0, 1, 0, which is, has only uh, a one hot component in the y, uh, y component, then n dot sigma is nothing but this sigma y. Then this problem simply reduced to this problem with, uh, with all, the, all the result follows, basically. So if here you also take n dot sigma, which is sigma y, then this is saying that the result is cosine theta times identity plus i sine theta times sigma y, which is nothing but this two by two formula. So if you have learned what has been done in the exercise as Taylor expansion, you should be able to finish this homework just following that approach. OK, any questions? about uh, matrix exponential.
Okay, good. So, uh, so with that, we can proceed. Uh, uh, then there's a final concept called uh, operator trace. Uh, trace of an operator is defined as taking the operator and then <laughs> sandwiching between the basis state and then sum over all the orthonormal basis state. So that's the definition of a trace of an operator in a Hilbert space. Because in any Hilbert space, you can always define a set of orthonormal bases. And it turns out the trace of an operator is independent of your basis choice, although it's defined using the uh, scalar product with the basis state. But it turns out to be basis independent. And then uh, uh, on the matrix level, what it means is basically taking all the diagonal matrix elements and then sum them together. The reason is that this operator sandwiching between the basis states basically give you the operator matrix uh, elements, right? So this index, this uh, bra state will label the uh, row index, this cat state will label the column index. But in this case, you can see the row and column index are the same, which correspond to the diagonal matrix element. And then this summation over i basically means summation over the diagonal matrix element, which is uh, like that, okay? So, uh, so, so trace also have nice properties following uh, by operator. Basically, you can, uh, you can linear combination property, which means you can first linear combine the operator and then take trace, or you can first take the trace and then linear combine their result. After taking the trace, the result is already a number, I should emphasize. So trace always reduce an operator, which is a matrix, back to a number. And the number correspond to, correspond to adding all the matrix elements along the diagonal. And then trace has a very wonderful property. For operators in general, <laughs> operators don't commute. Uh, two different ways of multiplying operator doesn't give you the same result. But it turns out if you, uh, if you put a trace out of the result of this operator, reducing it to a number, these two numbers always equal. So even though OP doesn't equal to PO at the matrix level as two matrices, you can show that it turns out uh, the diagonal matrix elements sum together, which uh, is, is always, e uh, always equal. So that's, that's um, uh, very amazing. Yeah? Uh, is, is it just a tool? Uh, is there like physical significance to what the trace is? Yes, there's, uh, there's uh, important physical si significance. The physical significance of, uh, uh, okay, uh, the mathematical convenience of trace is that it allows you to secretly exchange two operators inside the trace. And then the physical significance is that it actually allows you to calculate things like operator exp uh, uh, observable expectation value. And this number, <laughs> this trace actually uh, has to do with expectation values or probabilities. Any time when you try to evaluate, for example, uh, yeah, here is uh, examples. For example, if you want to, uh, uh, for example, when you take the, uh, previously we learned that scalar product can be written as a, as a cat and uh, uh, bra and cat. Uh, so, so, so if cat is there and bra is in the front, basically they product into a number. But we also learned that there is an outer product. Outer product is you exchange the place between cat and bra. So that result is a matrix. So trace has this nice property that converts a matrix into a number. So it basically relates outer product with inner product. Because the only difference between outer product and inner product between a, a cat and bra vector is that they are producting in different orders, right? And trace is the operation which allows you to forget about the order. So it basically uh, uh, converts uh, outer product into inner product. So why is that useful? Well, uh, uh, maybe not, not now, but in the future, we will see <laughs> that, uh, for example, you can, you can evaluate fidelity by evaluating this trace. Uh, the reason is that in many cases, computing this cat uh, or bra vector uh, it's not very easy. You need to diagonalize certain matrix in order to obtain this eigen, for example, this cat and bra state. Uh, eigen state of a matrix, matrix diagonalization is very difficult. But uh, if you can use the eigen state to construct a projection operator, so this is called a projection operator, which is the outer product of the state with itself, then uh, it turns out there's many use, uh, very easy <laughs> approach to construct this uh, 
projection operator. So trace allows you to compute something that is very difficult to compute. So this UV in the product sometimes is difficult to compute, but the trace of the uh, projection operator product is, can be much easier. <laughs> uh, you, you may not be able to see that for now, but uh, maybe we'll encounter that later. So it's a useful uh, uh, quantity. Okay, and then uh, there's a property for Pauli operators uh, that is Pauli operator or traceless. Uh, or, or, uh, other than identity operator, identity operator has a trace two uh, in this two dimensional Hilbert space, and all these three Pauli, non trivial Pauli op operators, their trace is zero. And this is, uh, this is actually true for any linear combination of Pauli operators, so uh, that's also true. Uh, Okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's all I want to say about operator algebra. Any <laughs> questions? Okay, yeah? Um, I just have one on the, the trace, uh -huh. uh, the cyclic permutation. Uh -huh. So what you're saying with the cyclic permutation is that uh, trace of OPQ is equal to trace of PQO, but it wouldn't be equal to uh, trace of QEO? No, <laughs> you need to permute it cyclically other than permute, permute it arbitrarily. For example, you cannot exchange P and Q yeah. in O, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in the presence of O, yes. <clears throat> mm. Yes? It, then you need to assume all these operators can be diagonalized simultaneously, which is not true. So actually, to prove it, uh, you don't go to the diagonal basis. Uh, yeah, the trick is to insert certain res resolution of identity, and then, and then you can prove it. It's it's just a few lines. Uh, yeah. So once you insert this resolution of identity, you can you can now these two becomes numbers. You you can now exchange numbers, and then once you exchange these numbers, and then uh, because the product of number is always commutative, then you can you can you can uh, annihilate this uh, uh, sum over i by uh, by by another resolution of identity. So that's that's the idea. Okay. Okay, so that's, uh, that's about operator algebra. So now, now we are going to talk about physics now. <laughs> so uh, there are two important things that I want to explain. One is measurement, the other is dynamics. So today we are going to learn, learn about measurement. Because we, we said that qu uh, quantum mechanics provides a description of quantum system uh, by saying that every state is a vector. And then uh, based on this description, it needs to be able to give us some predictions. For example, if I observe the system, uh, if I make a measurement, uh, what should I see? Uh, so, so this is all about that. And measurement is closely related to a very special type of operator called Hermitian operator. In order to under Hermit understand Hermitian operator, we need to start from the definition of Hermitian conjugate of an operator. We need to first introduce that. So what's the motivation to introduce Hermitian conjugate? Well, we have explained why, how an operator acts on a cat state, but we know that every cat state has a dual bra state. So, there, uh, so if the cat state goes from uh, acts by the operator and becomes a new state, and then its corresponding dual bra state also gets acted by something and becomes the corresponding new bra state, right? So that's what we want to understand. What's that something? What's that uh, dual operator in the dual Hilbert space that acts on the bra state? So here is a table that summarizes uh, uh, cat state and bra state. So the cat state lives in the Hilbert space, and the bra state lives in the dual Hilbert space. People usually denote as an H star. And this star indicates that it's very important to take complex conjugate everywhere in the, <laughs> in the dual space. And then for the cat state, you may have a set of bases that spans uh, this cat state, and the corresponding dual bases are this dual bra state. And then the any states, uh, any cat state is a linear combination of the cat basis. If the cat basis is uh, represented as one hot univectors, then this uh, cat state will be a column vector, uh, where the vector 
components are the corresponding uh, linear superposition coefficient. And correspondingly, uh, its dual version is that uh, it will, again, be a linear superposition, but every superposition coefficient gets complex conjugated. And the corresponding vector representation becomes a row vector with every component complex conjugated. So you can see already at the vector, at the state level, going from the uh, cat state to the bra state through this duality, what happens is that you take the, this vector and complex transpose the vector. You can view this vector as a matrix, as a single column matrix, right? Then if you transpose the matrix, which means you are exchanging the row of uh, row and column, basically exchanging row and column, and then so a column matrix becomes a row matrix, uh, a row, row vector, and then uh, but followed by complex conjugation. So all you are doing is basically transpose followed by complex conjugation. So that's the idea, how to connect uh, uh, a cat state to a bra state. The corresponding component will be related by this uh, scalar product. So, uh, so you, you can see by definition, if you exchange the scalar product indices or states there, uh, basically they are also related by complex conjugation. So now, if we have an operator which is defined in this way or represented as a matrix like that, uh, or its matrix component is actually ac also defined in this way, then if you have this operator acting on this state, give you a new state, uh, which, which is in this cat version, then there is a corresponding bra version that uh, there is another operator which acts on the bra state that gives you the corresponding bra state. And this new operator may not be the same as the original operator. This new operator is called the O dagger. <laughs> and then uh, this, uh, this, this is a dagger symbol. Uh, this is not a plus. If you zoom in, it actually looks like a little dagger. <laughs> and then uh, this uh, dagger, uh, also, we, or, or you may call it a con, con, Hermitian conjugate of this operator, actually is defined in this way uh, as a new, new matrix, where the matrix elements are related to the previous matrix element by complex uh, transpose, basically. First, you transpose the matrix, meaning that you are exchanging the off-diagonal matrix element, so O12 becomes O21, and O21 becomes O12, followed by complex conjugation of every matrix element. So you can see every matrix element gets a star. Okay, So that's uh, actually similar to what we are doing to the state. So the operator also gets a, a, a conjugate transposed. Uh, the reason that this is the right thing to do is because if you start from this formula, this is like a square matrix multiplying on a column vector, give you a new column vector. In order to flip everything down to the row vector version, we know that the row vector must multiply the matrix from the left, right? The matrix must act on the right in order to be able to multiply with the row vector, otherwise the dimension don't match. So, uh, so, so if you have a matrix multiplying on the column, then it becomes a new matrix, a transpose version matrix multiply on a row. And because the, these two not only differ by a transpose, but also differ by a complex conjugation, so every matrix element also need to be conjugated. So that explains why when we go from the uh, uh, cat to bra, uh, the corresponding operator actually needs to go from O to O dagger, where O dagger simply is uh, what people call Hermitian conjugate or complex trans, uh, conjugate followed by transpose, uh, either way. Okay, so, uh, so this is exactly what I said. Uh, that's the definition of uh, O dagger. O dagger is defined to be the operator that takes the bra version to the bra version. Okay, so, so that's why every operator has a corresponding uh, Hermitian conjugate uh, version because every state has a has a dual. Uh, every cat state has a dual bra. So every uh, o, o operator has a dual o, o dagger. <clears throat> Given a set of orthonormal bases, we can represent uh, this O operator in this way uh, in terms of linear superposition of basis operator as we explained previously, and then the, its corresponding dual operator, as we said, will just be uh, another superposition of the basis uh, operation, but the superposition coefficient compared to the previous one has two difference. One is that these indices i and j uh, exchange their places, so this oij becomes oji, the uh, combination coefficient in front of 
uh, cat i bra j is not o i j but o j i. So this o i j to o j i basically correspond to transpose, right? You are exchanging the row index and the column index, and followed by a complex conjugation. So the second difference is that if this is a complex number, this is the complex uh, number uh, after transpose, uh, the conjugate uh, complex number after transpose. So essentially, uh, this dagger basically means transpose followed by complex conjugation. Uh, although we use this uh, matrix vector multiplication to introduce this idea of uh, complex uh, co conjugate transpose, and then uh, it seems to be uh, basis dependent, but it, in fact, this definition, the way that you need to define the uh, Hermitian conjugate uh, as that is actually basis independent in, uh, if you want to uh, try to prove that uh, without using explicit matrix representation, you can take a look at this exercise. But it's always, uh, <laughs> it's always easy <laughs> just to <laughs> remember <laughs> that uh, Hermitian conjugate basically correspond to uh, uh, matrix principles followed by complex conjugation. Uh, because in, in most of the cases, we actually deal with a very concrete operator which has matrix representations. <clears throat> And then this uh, uh, Hermitian conjugate has uh, several uh, properties, basic property. For example, uh, first of all, it's duality. Because Hermitian conjugates used to do an operator to the dual space. So if you do it back, then you go back to the original operator. So if you Hermitian conjugate twice, uh, you restore the original operator. And then it has a certain uh, linearity. Again, if a certain linear combination of operator un under uh, this Hermitian conjugate becomes a, a new linear combination, where the, where the linear combination coefficient gets complex conjugated. Uh, and then uh, it also has a transpose po property, which means if you have uh, the product of two operator and then Hermitian conjugate, they correspond to the Hermitian conjugate of each, of each one of the operator, but product in the opposite way. Because we know that if you have two matrices product together followed by a transpose, then uh, that means the, it's the transpose matrix product in the opposite way. Because after transpose, you are exchanging column and rows. So that's why you need to uh, multiply the matrix from the opposite direction. Okay, so uh, is that clear? Any questions? Okay, very good. So that leads to a <laughs> concept called Hermitian operator, which is very important. Every observable in quantum mechanics is a Hermitian operator. The intuition of Hermitian operator is like real numbers. Real numbers play special role in physics. Uh, the result of any experiment, any measurements are real. If you measure the position of some particle, momentum of some particle, you never get uh, a complex numbers because your <laughs> measurement device cannot provide complex numbers, right? So all the measurement readouts are real numbers. That's why measurement is closely related to real numbers. But in quantum mechanics, uh, physical observables are represented actually by operators. So how do we impose the reality condition on the operators? How do we impose, how do we require the operator to always give you some kind of a real result, not an <laughs> imaginary result, right? Because this operator in, in general can be a complex matrix, so you, you can't guarantee its reality. Well, for the real numbers, the way to impose that a number, a complex number is real is by saying that the number is equal to its complex conjugation. So if z is a generic complex number and satisfy this condition, that means z is along the real axis. It's, uh, it's real. Uh, uh, of course, for real numbers, it also equals to its complex conjugation. So now, when we go to operator, and then we are dealing with complex matrices. So instead of uh, talking about uh, complex conjugation, we actually need to talk about uh, Hermitian conjugation. So the matrix version of taking the conjugation is actually Hermitian conjugation. So a so-called real operator, or a more precise way, uh, a way people call it, is called Hermitian operator. What people mean by Hermitian operator is a linear operator whose Hermitian conjugate is itself. Uh, just like a real number is complex conjugation is itself. So an operator is Hermitian uh, if and only if O equals O dagger. Or in terms of the matrix element, <laughs> OIJ equals OJI star. 
basically the off-diagonal matrix elements that are related by transpose are also conjugate to each other, then, uh, then this matrix is uh, permission. Also, this condition means that if you have a matrix element on the diagonal, right, on the diagonal i and j is the same, then that means the diagonal matrix element must be real. So a uh, Hermitian matrix actually looks like a matrix whose diagonal is always real, but is off-diagonal. <laughs> the two triangles on the off-diagonal are complex conjugate to each other. So Hermitian matrix has very nice properties in terms of its eigensystems. Uh, let me remind you that we previously, uh, when we reviewed the uh, linear algebra, we talked about eigenstates and eigen, uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues, uh, which is about matrices. Uh, so for any operator, we can also define its eigenvectors, because any, any operator, every operator is a, is a matrix. So uh, any matrix, you can fi try to find its eigensystem. The eigenvectors is a set of special vectors on which the operator acts on the eigenvector is like a scalar multiplication on the vector. So that this is called the eigen equation. So this equation specifies or defines what are the eigenvectors. Eigenvectors are those special vectors such that operator acting on that like a matrix multiplying on this column vector, generally it will change the components of the column vector, but in some cases, it will just, the change will just be like an overall uh, scalar factor multiplying that vector. So if that's the case, this vector is very special. It's called eigenvector, and the corresponding scalar factor is called eigenvalue. And then this is an eigen equation of an operator. And then for an operator, there, be, there may be more than one eigenvector. There can be uh, many, many eigenvectors uh, in, in all different directions. And then the way to find eigenvector is trying to solve this uh, equation. But this equation simply means that uh, O minus OK times uh, identity acting on this uh, vector needs to be 0. And the solution for this equation, we are trying to find the solution of this vector, right? And then uh, this, this vector usually <laughs> don't have solutions because uh, if this matrix in the front is invertible, we can simply inverse the matrix to the other side of the equation. Then this vector will be a matrix multiplying a zero vector. Matrix multiplying any zero vector is going to give you a zero vector. So, uh, so in general, if without any condition on these matrices or on these eigenvalues, this eigenvector will just vanish. There's no non-trivial solution for this eigenvector. Of course, we hope to have a non-zero solution of the eigenvector, right? So in order to have a non-zero solution of, of this vector, it must be the case that this matrix is not invertible. You can't just simply inverse the matrix to the other side to solve this linear equation. The, the condition that the matrix is not invertible is called the matrix is singular, or the determinant of this matrix is zero. So that's the condition that the matrix is not invertible. So in order to find what's the uh, correct value to make the matrix not invertible, <laughs> you actually need to try and solve this determinant equation. And then uh, when you take this matrix, uh, operator of course is a matrix, this O is a number, this O is supposed to be an eigenvalue, this, uh, this one is like an identity uh, matrix, so all together the whole thing is still a matrix, and then the determinant of a matrix, well, that's uh, complicated, <laughs> that's a <laughs> polynomial, <laughs> that becomes a polynomial of this uh, number O, okay? And then uh, by solving this polynomial equation, uh, you can try to find the uh, value uh, of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Again, this is uh, in principle how you should do it. Uh, um, uh, if you just have pen and pencil, you <laughs> have to solve this polynomial equation. But nowadays, since we all have Mathematica, and uh, it's free, and then you can just uh, eigensystem uh, any matrix uh, you want to, uh, uh, you are, uh, of interest, and then it will give you the answer. The answer will be given like the eigenvalues are here, and then the corresponding eigenvectors are here. So this eigenvector corresponding to, correspond to that eigenvalue, this eigenvector correspond to that eigenvalue, okay? <clears throat> for Hermitian matrices, for Hermitian operators, what is special? Well, its eigensystem uh, has a special property that's a very important special property that the eigenvalues are all real. So uh, the reason is that, um, I think I, I'm going to prove it later, but uh, yeah. But let me make the statement. <laughs> so suppose O equals O transpose, uh, sorry, O equals O 
dagger, which means it's a, O is a Hermitian operator. Then uh, it also has a set of eigen equations, but the nice property is that all the eigenvalues are real and all the eigenvectors forms a complete set of bases, meaning that any vector in, this, uh, in the same Hilbert space uh, in which this uh, O is represented can be expanded as a sum of its eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors of different eigenvalues are always orthogonal to each other. So if you have uh, uh, two different eigenvalues, then its uh, corresponding eigenvectors will have a zero uh, scalar product. That means they are orthogonal. And then the eigenvector of the same eigenvalue is not guaranteed to be orthogonal, <laughs> uh, but you can always make them orthogonal. Meaning that if you have two uh, vectors, for example, uh, when they are not uh, orthogonal in the space, you can always linearly combine them to make it uh, orthogonal basis. The reason is that uh, if you have two vectors uh, which correspond to the same eigenvalue of the, uh, of the operator or the matrix, then any linear combination of these two vectors is still an eigenvector of the operator with the same eigenvalue. Okay? So that's why uh, if you have two um, or more than two uh, eigenvectors of the same eigenvalue, you can always try to linearly combine them. You are always free to do that. And then there's always a way to combine them <laughs> such that they are all orthogonal to each other because they basically span. Instead of saying that these are eigenvectors, you should actually think that this eigenvector spans an eigen subspace. It's actually a space uh, where every vector inside this subspace which means any linear combination of the eigenvectors uh, of the same eigenvalue is a legitimate eigenvector of the same eigenvalue. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so, so for these reasons, uh, this uh, Hermitian operator has nice properties that, uh, also there's another <laughs> property that uh, if the Hermitian operator is bounded, what does it mean by bounded? It means that if it is a finite matrix in a, a finite dimension, meaning that every matrix element is finite, you don't put an infinity in the matrix element, and then the dimension of the matrix is also finite, in that case, uh, the eigenvector can always be normalized. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> so, so, uh, so here is about uh, if if it is a uh, uh, eigenvectors of the same eigenvalue. So, w w how do you obtain eigenvector of same eigenvalue? Okay. So you first find the eigenvalue, right, by solving determinant equals zero. And then you try to solve a linear equation, try to find the eigenvector. Maybe you will find the first solution. OK, you write down the solution. And then you try to see whether there is a second solution. If, there, if, you, if you cannot find a second solution that is not linearly independent to the first solution, then you are done. There's no more than one eigenvector correspond to that eigenvalue. That eigenvalue has only one eigenvector. If you can find a new solution, that new solution by definition is linearly independent of the previous solution. <laughs> is that too complicated? <laughs> so for example, uh, for example, I have a matrix which goes like uh, one half, one half, and two. <laughs> So what does this matrix do to a three-dimensional vector? X, Y, Z. It sends X, Y, Z to half of X, half of Y, and, and, and twice of Z, basically. So if you have a coordinate system, X, Y, and Z, and then what are the eigenvector? Generally, if you have a vector like that, it will be stretched in the z direction multiplied by two times and squeezed in the xy plane, in, uh, no matter which point it points to. So it will basically tilt up uh, towards the z direction, right? So th those vectors are not eigenvectors. Eigenvector, for example, a vector along the z direction is an eigenvector. So 0, 0, 1, 
is an eigenvector whose eigenvalue, corresponding eigenvalue, is 2. Because if you put a vector like that, and then you multiply this matrix, ma vector gets uh, stretched to that. Th that's easy. In that case, uh, this eigenvalue 2 has only one eigenvector, which is 0, 0, 0, 1. So the complicated things coming from x and y. <laughs> so if you try to find an eigenvector in, <laughs> well, for example, <laughs> 1, 0, 0 is one eigenvector. So, uh, so it's, that's on this direction, because if you apply this matrix, it gets squeezed into half of its uh, length, right? But any vector in this plane is an uh, eigenvector. So the question is, do they necessarily become linearly independent? No, it depends on how you solve it, right? <laughs> you try to find an eigenvector correspond to this matrix, and this is the first solution you found. Of course, driven by curiosity, you want to find a different solution. You don't want to find a solution that is simply related by a linear factor, uh, by a factor right? Then, then these two are linearly dependent to each other. You want to find a new solution. For example, any like a 2.5, 0 0.5. This is also an eigenvector <coughs> of this matrix of the same eigenvalue. Both of them are of eigenvalue 1 half. So if you just randomly sample eigenvector, very likely you will find a new eigenvector, which is linearly independent of the previous one. Then you can use the Schmidt's uh, procedure to, <laughs> to find the <laughs> y component, right? Because uh, once you orthogonalize these two, uh, basically the second eigenvector becomes 0, 1, 0. Yeah, because, because uh, the, although we talk about uh, eigenvectors, but usually, uh, but actually you, should think, you, should, you shouldn't think about it as a set of vectors, but a basis of a space. So eigenvectors is not just a set of vectors. <laughs> it's actually labels a, a space. So you should actually talk about eigenspace. Every eigenvalue is not associated to an eigenvector that's, or, or a set of eigenvectors. That's a wrong concept. <laughs> Every eigenvalue is associated to a space. For example, eigenvalue 2 is associated to the subspace, which corresponds to this z-axis. And then the eigenvalue 1 half is associated to a subspace, which is a xy plane. So the xy plane, this plane, <laughs> this two-dimensional plane as a subspace in the three-dimensional space is the eigenspace of this eigenvalue one half. Any vector in this space is an eigenvector. And then we just take two typical eigenvectors or basis eigenvector to represent this plane, and that's it. You should, they, they, they are not mean to be the right answer. There's no unique answer when, when there's degeneracies. You, you have infinite number of choices of eigenvectors when, 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 when the eigenvalues are degenerate. Uh, is the, does that, sorry, does that answer the question? Mm. Ah. Okay. And any further questions? Okay, so, uh, so <clears throat> so that's what I want to talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors of Hermitian operators. Uh, you may be curious of proving all these properties, then I will leave that to the exercise again. Uh, uh, so the, the important properties are uh, for Hermitian operator, eigenvalues are all real, and then eigenvector actually can span uh, uh, a complete set of orthonormal basis. Uh, you just find all possible eigenvectors of uh, every eigenvalues, and then you orthogonalize those eigenvectors which are not uh, orthogonal. Uh, eigenvectors of uh, different eigenvalues are <laughs> automatically orthogonal, so you don't need to worry about them. Okay, so, uh, so these, uh, these eigenvectors after orthogonalization is called an uh, eigenbasis. And then every Hermitian operator actually defines a, 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 or can generate a set of eigenbases. And then in that set of eigenbases, uh, the, uh, so first of all, this eigenbasis is complete, means that you can expand any state vector in terms of this uh, basis state. So it serves as a, uh, uh, another set of uh, basis state, which is as good as uh, your original choice of the one-hot vector <laughs> basis. So they also have this uh, completeness uh, relation, which is the resolution of identity. 
And then uh, the Hermitian operator itself can always be represented in its own basis, leading to the so-called spectral decomposition, which is very important. In general, an operator, uh, when, you, when you write down an operator, it's a, it's a linear combination of, uh, remember, it looks like uh, i and j, and then i, o, i, j, j, right? So, so, so for a generic operator, it's like that. But if you, if, if you diagonalize this operator, you no longer need to sum over i and j. You only need to sum over k. k is the label of the eigenvalue. And then uh, also the label of the corresponding eigenstate. So, so many cases, we basically use the eigenvalue to label the eigenstate, the corresponding eigenstate. So that's why we write things in this way. And then... Uh, uh, so for Hermitian operator, once you can diagonalize it, you can re re rewrite it in, 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 in this form. And then this also means that uh, the Hermitian operator in its own basis is basically diagonal because this is like a diagonal matrix with uh, OK being the matrix element along the diagonal. So the, so the process of taking a matrix to its diagonal form is called uh, diagonalization, which basically amounts to finding the eigenvectors of the matrix. Because once you find that all the eigenbases of this uh, Hermitian matrix, you can represent it in a new basis, and then it becomes diagonal. Diagonalization is particularly useful for constructing operator functions. Uh, for example, uh, if you have a function of operator previously defined, which is, looks very complicated, but in the diagonal basis, uh, you can basically uh, take the function, act on every uh, diagonal matrix element, and that's it, recombine with the basis state. And you can try to prove that. This is because the power of this diagonal matrix, or, or that diagonal matrix has very nice properties, 